So, I'd like to start by presenting two categories of experience, some examples. And the first category will be the times in life when we become needlessly worried or activated for no reason. And the second set of examples will be uh, the times in life when we're completely caught off guard, when we weren't uh, in any way uh, vigilant. So one example would be in, say, work, where we might find ourselves worried at the slightest sign of there being any possibility that the job will end or the, a boss doesn't like our, doesn't like us, our personality or something, uh, as opposed to uh, one of those situations where we're working and then out of the blue we get downsized. In England they call it made redundant. Uh, I like that phrase a little bit more, although it's kind of awful to be told you're redundant. Uh, but they find that a more humane way to refer to it. So, um, a second example might be in dating, that awful arena, uh, where we might become activated because we're, we've been dating someone and they don't return a text message, because I guess that's the way all communications are achieved these days. No one using a phone anymore or, or talking face to face. Um, so somebody might not return a text message and we might become activated and think they're losing interest as opposed to somebody suddenly breaking up with us when we're not in any way prepared for it. And another example, you're walking down the street and uh, you see somebody who looks for some reason uh, uh, triggering, suspicious, and you become needlessly uh, activated and anxious, as opposed to a situation in life where suddenly out of the blue you might get attacked by a lunatic or by a mugger and have them, uh, lunatic, a hooligan. Uh, you get attacked by somebody for your iPhone who runs away. So, uh, you get the example is between all the times in life we become needlessly activated and those times in life are out of the blue, something bad happens when we're not prepared. Now, the survival mechanisms of the brain, which are the midbrain and the brain stem, all the preconscious regions of the brain, would rather you again and again and again, 10,000 times over for the rest of your life, do example number one, become needlessly activated and stressed over nothing, than ever have you once be caught off guard. It would rather have you constantly activated and worried rather than you ever once being caught off guard. Why is this? Well, uh, Homo sapiens appeared about 150,000 years ago. The last inbreeding or advance of the brain stopped around 70,000 years ago. In other words, you're born into brains that were set up to help you survive the way the Earth was 70,000 years ago. Guess what? Times have changed. Making a mistake, being caught off guard, will not cause you your life anymore. In fact, as Steven Pinker, one of the great neuroscientists who also likes to crunch numbers, has demonstrated, uh, we now live for our species in by far and away the safest time in history. Even in the worst war zones imaginable, even if we were living in Syria or Gaza or somewhere, the, de the death rate that is happening today is only a fraction of what it was over 400 years ago. The death rate was something like 60 times 
which means that your likelihood of being violently killed before you reach an old age and die of something naturally was 60 times greater. 70,000 years ago, the average human lifespan was in the 20s. Death was everywhere. Just getting through the day involved dodging predators. So, the brain is set up to avoid being caught off guard. It considers being caught off guard the equivalent of the worst thing that could possibly happen. And yet none of us today will be uh, suddenly, violently ripped apart by wild dogs, speared, or uh, I don't know even how people died 70,000 years ago, but it was probably awful. So we're kept in a, just our programming is kept in a needlessly, needlessly, I would argue 60 times more vigilant and wary and worried than we need to be. And that's just your programming. Guess what? There's other factors that can make you needlessly worried on top of it. Suppose, for example, you had anything less than the most wonderful caretaking in your childhood. If you were exposed to abuse, uh, in constant caretaking, or if you were brought up in extreme scarcity, then on top of our already needlessly alert and activated survival settings, then you would, or, then on top of that, you would have a hyperactivated amygdala that would constantly be triggering you into suspicion whenever you meet somebody new or whenever somebody uh, does something even remotely uh, difficult to interpret. You might become hypervigilant trying to read people's expressions. And then on top of that, we live in a time where we are bombarded, bombarded with media which completely um, makes up threats out of complete thin air. The chances are, I hate to say this, and at the risk of adding a moment of politics into my normally benign Dharma talks, but the chances of any of us being killed by a terrorist is far less than any of us being killed by a policeman. And yet, guess what most people fear? We fear the terrorists that are not there. They might be executing people in fear, but they're not here. So we're kept activated by media that predicts countless downturns, uh, predicts uh, uh, all kinds of imminent catastrophes. My most recent one was a huge scare that went up over the bird flu. No one died. More people will die each day from eating hot dogs than died of the fucking bird flu. But guess what CNN blathered on all the time. So we're kept constantly activated over threats that don't exist. And then, on top of all this, if this was not enough to keep you in chronic stress, then there's also the human brain's tendency for mood contagion. What's that, you ask, warily and suspicious of even the term? <laughs> mood contagion is the mind's, uh, is set up to imitate other people. Have you noticed that you yawn when other people yawn? You tap your foot when they tap their foot? That you start uh, moving in sync in certain ways with other people? This is not by accident. The right hemisphere of the brain is actually set up to establish secure connections with others by imitating them, by repeating, mirroring back their actions. So if you work in a place that is needlessly stressed, where there's people who are anxious, competing, worried about their jobs, out to look after number one, keeping up with the rat race, 
keeping their head above water, which is shark infested. I don't know. I'm running out of adjectives. But if you're in one of those work environments, you're kind of fucked because your brain will absorb, soak up, and will start to take on the stress. Even if you've got a diligent spiritual practice, it will take a lot of work to maintain calm because we are set up. Even the Buddha, uh, who liked to emphasize uh, the great um, powers of meditation and spiritual practice and compassion, but he noted uh, in the Idibhutaka, he said, by all means, first thing, just check out the people you're hanging out with because you're going to turn into them if you're not careful. It's a great pseudo. So there's a lot of reason why we maintain a constant state of activation. And this um, activation, as we discussed, is really quite needless because not only are we safer than we've ever been, but maintaining chronic stress is extremely damaging to your health. It actually keeps cortisol pumping, which creates everything from diabetes to uh, Alzheimer's because it attacks the hippocampus, and it, which is the chief reason why people have significant memory, short-term memory loss. It has extreme health uh, detriments in terms of blood glucose levels, um, heart attack, high blood pressure. It even when you're needlessly worried, what happens is you stop producing white blood cells, which are the things that stand as your first defense against cancer. And it creates red blood cells. Why? Because when you're worried, you are biologically programmed to expect that you're going to be attacked. Even if you've simply activated yourself because somebody is giving you a weird look at work, your body doesn't know that it's simply, oh, somebody is giving me a weird look, I'm worried I might be fired, and I'm set up to fear any unknown event. Your body thinks, holy shit, I'm going to be attacked by a wild boar. I got to create red blood cells so I can repair the tissue damage that's going to result. Yes, that's what we're doing every time we get activated by a conflict in life. We stop producing white blood cells, we stop digesting, and we start producing red blood cells, which are actually, guess what, pretty unnecessary in an office conflict. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are so primed by our culture, our families, our workplaces, and our, and our basic programming to be agitated, wary, hypervigilant, monitoring everybody around us, trying to read people's expressions, figuring out what they're thinking about us, worrying if they're thinking something bad, sensitive to criticism, um, that by the time we become an adult, even when we find a little bit of peace in our life, we can be really triggered by peace into, oh shit, what the fuck? I was on the beach several years ago. I'm not a beach person. <laughs> I can do nothing with the best of them, but drive me to a hot place with sand and ask me to do nothing, and I go crazy. So uh, it's one of the very few places where I have no ability to just relax like other people. Uh, I can do that by the East River, but bring me out to... Uh, what the fuck am I talking about? Anyway, so... Uh, so I was on the beach with some people out in Hipster Beach. Where is that? Fort Til Tilden, yeah? I was out in Fort Tilden, and I was hanging out with a bunch of people several years ago, and it, we were all relaxing, and somebody jumped up. And I was like, oh, shit, what's the matter? You remember, like, you you left the stove on? He was like, no, I was, I was suddenly totally relaxed. <laughs> The state of actually attaining ease was confused with being vulnerable because he was so programmed to be on guard alert that um, he didn't, uh, he was never turning off the activated worry mechanisms of the midbrain, the amygdala, the HBA axis, etc. And the interesting thing is that 
we can't, if we don't make sure we turn off our activation, they will keep going on. We'll stay activated. Generally it goes like this. We become worried about something we have no control over, the economy. You turn on the news, oh shit, it's all going to hell. Oh fuck. I, I barely have any savings as is, and now I'm told it's all going to shit. I'm going to turn this off. And then what we do is we distract ourselves. We go on Facebook and change the subject as quickly as we can so that we don't have to think about the feeling of vulnerability. So what happens is we pull the mind away from the activation, but the body is still pumping. The cortisol is still flowing. Adrenaline is still flowing. We're hyperventilating. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. And then the body's tight, chest contracted, stomach taut, shoulders up above our ears, but arms constricted. The mind is like the only thing that's relaxed because it's sought blob, it's, it's sought fairy tale land in Facebook, you know, where everything we do is liked. Just post something. But meanwhile, the body is activated. And it stays activated for a significant period. For It takes about a half an hour for all the cortisol and the adrenaline to go away if we don't manually do it ourselves. So if you simply pull your attention away from an activated state, you're going to stay activated. You just won't be aware of it. And then if somebody comes in and interrupts you, you go, what? It's that activated state that's still in place. Very often at work, we can feel put upon and weighed down by responsibilities simply because we haven't learned how to deactivate stress states that come from any kind of fear activation. So, the key of the second part of tonight's talk is I like to always... I basically structure my all my talks in the exact same way. <laughs> Very little imagination in my structure. I always introduce the shit to be worried about and then the tools so that we can deal with it. So, uh, as we move on to the tools now, uh, the goal of all of these tools is to give you ways to actually, one, deactivate stress that's arisen, wariness, worry, your uh, needlessly uh, vigilant, hypervigilant states whenever they are triggered, and two, to reduce the amount of needless activations in your life. So, the first thing I have to say is that logic will play no role in any of this, because logic is a part of the left hemisphere of your brain and that arrives so late in the day that it's a useless tool when it comes to stress. A lot of people try to use logic when our friends are worried, panicked, uh, bent out of shape, and we try to talk them into common sense, what we believe to be uh, right-mindedness. But the problem is, is that when somebody's activated, all of those activations are pre-conscious. And none of the regions of the brain that activate us are capable of understanding words. Your amygdala, your hypothalamus, these are not language centers of your brain. And in fact, they are active and triggering before you even get the chance to argue with them. So we need to use different tools if we want to uh, develop calm in our lives, to have less uh, constant chronic stress. The first tool is to show, not to tell the mind that we're safe. Now, one way to do it, as I talk about very frequently, is the simple approach to grab hold of your exhalations and to make them at least twice as long as your inhalations. The very minimum. If you want to have like a you know, but it's interesting. People are now buying all these gadgets that they wear in their wrist to let them know when there's, you know, something going wrong with the body or how much they're exercising. But if you want to have a very simple apparatus to know when you're stressed out, the only thing you need to do is observe your breath. 
if you're out, if you haven't been exercising, but your out breath is shorter than the length of your in breath, you're stressed. Your out-breath is uh, directly controlled by the vagal vagus nerve, which uh, is a direct indicator of how much cortisol and, and sympathetic nervous system activation you have. If your out-breath is short, it means your in-breath is being focused on. You're trying to bring in oxygen because your body is anticipating a fight or conflict, and that's because you've triggered a fear activation. So... If you stretch out the length of your out-breath, you're informing these pre-conscious regions of the brain that actually everything's okay. You're not about to be attacked, that nothing bad is going to happen. The second way you can do it is by simply finding an area in your body that gets tight every time you get worried. I'll give you a hint. It's called your shoulders. And relax them. Why do your shoulders get tight when you're worried and anxious? Well... It's a residue of the startle reflex, which is a core instinct that all of us homo sapiens have. We're born with it. When we feel overwhelmed or under threat, we go into the fetal position, and the way we start doing that is by activating these muscles in the top of the body. Also what happens is we contract the muscles in the stomach. So you relax the stomach and the shoulders. You're going to move yourself out of a stress reaction. Another way is to simply show the mind we're okay by, in every situation, scanning and observing all the resources and secure places you have. Now, the mind is going to want to scan out threats. When you go into a party where you're unfamiliar, when we walk into a room where we don't know people or a meeting where we're a little anxious about, it's your programming to look for the most unfriendly face the most judgmental face, the face that's not warmly regarding you. You're looking for the one person who's not welcoming you. So what we need to do is override this mechanism and pull awareness back to the friendly faces in the room, the people who are smiling, and maintain awareness. Now, I've read an interesting study that for a negative... um, a negative uh, face to make, uh, to be known to the forebrain, I'm sorry, the uh, midbrain, it only takes about a half a second. For a positive face, it takes five seconds, 20, no, 10 times longer. That shows you my math. So you've got to keep your brain 10 times longer on a positive expression to undo the searching for threats or a sign that somebody doesn't like you. So it requires some vigilance but it's worthwhile. Finally, uh, the Buddha's famous meta-meditation, may I be peaceful, may I be happy, may I be free of stress. Now, you might think, well, aren't those words, isn't that appealing to logic? No, actually, the reason why mantras work, the reason why repeating words work, is because they pull awareness away from the triggers and they focus us on words that we've associated over time with self-soothing. So it's not so much the actual words that de-trigger, just the action itself of repeating a phrase over and over that's compassionate keeps you away from thoughts that trigger fear and anxiety. So metta is a very good practice, just adding the, uh, repeating the phrase, may I feel safe, may I feel peaceful, may I feel safe, may I feel peaceful, or I love you, keep going, I love you, keep going. So that's the first tool. Show the mind that we're safe. Change the breath, change the body, find compassionate-looking people, repeat metaphrases. Now the second tools go into the process of uh, stopping the brain from reactivating as often and really efficiently deactivating us in another way. There's a wonderful psychologist named Barbara Fredrickson, and she answered what was a great puzzle for uh, clinical psychologists. The puzzle was, why do we have happy emotions? Why do we have positive emotions? Survival-wise, it's obvious why we have fear, anger, 
uh, shame, because those emotions are directly goading us to survival actions. But for a long period of time, nobody could really quite convincingly argue why we have positive emotions. And Fredrickson came up with a very simple and elegant answer, which is now pretty much the established answer, which is that the first thing that positive emotions like contentment and amusement do is they deactivate fear. They deactivate the nervous system and they kick in the, the, what breaks and relaxes us, the parasympathetic nervous system. So we have positive emotions to one, turn us off, but also B, positive emotions broaden the emotional responses we can bring to any situation. If you're in a negative emotion, you pretty much only have three choices how to respond to any given situation, which is to fight, to flight, or to play dead. That's the entire vocabulary of negative emotions in terms of actions. If you're in a positive state, you can respond in many different ways. You can recall different ways other people have dealt with situations and survived. You can recall times that you've survived being caught off guard and deactivate yourself. You can reach out for help and talk to other people. You can ask yourself what would be the long-term consequences of this action if I do it. You can remind yourself that no matter how things turn out, you probably will be okay. You can, there's a lot of different ways you can respond if you've cultivated positive emotions. The problem is, is of course, positive emotions don't come as easy and naturally to the brain as the negative ones do. So we have to learn literally to cultivate contentment because the brain is set up primarily to survive and override any contentment as quickly as possible. So, how do we create contentment in a way that it will help reprogram the mind? Well, the first way is we spot in life a rewarding experience. You might paint, draw, write something, accomplish something. Take a moment. Soak in the experience of your creativity. You might do something nice for someone. Soak that in. You might see something unusual. This is New York. You will see unusual things. Take a moment to soak it in. Enjoy the freak show. We live in a city where there's a weird-looking building going up every fucking minute. If we don't take in the skyline and everything that's popping up around us and changing, we can completely lose track. So... Soaking in everything that's fresh and new, pulling the mind away from fear activations, is an extremely beneficial practice. Especially when we get together with people we love or we uh, do something that we really enjoy, whether it's yoga, riding a bike, sitting by the water, anything, soak it in. Here's another statistic you don't need. That's my job to overwhelm you. It takes, the same person who pointed out that it takes the brain five times longer to read a, a, ne a pleasant expression over a negative facial expression, it takes 12 seconds for a positive experience to be lodged in the brain, in the hippocampus for long-term memory, it only takes, once again, that measly half a second for a threat situation to be lodged in the amygdala for ongoing fear. So if we really want to begin the hard work of deactivating ourselves so that we can do our daily commutes and office routines without needlessly being wrapped up, we've got to learn to spot uh, a good experience and stay with it for 12 fucking seconds. And that doesn't sound that long, but when was the last time you stayed with something for 12 seconds that wasn't on a TV screen? Many of us don't. We're like, oh, look at that. That's interesting. But what over there? Oh, shit, I got this call. Oh, but what are you saying? I forget that. Okay, what's going on? Oh, look at that. That's amazing. Oh, fuck that. Who cares? There's very little lingering going on. 
the Byronic image of a person walking by a windswept landscape and taking in the majest- majesty of nature is not happening these days. We got to develop it. Appreciating beauty. One way that we can stay with things and really embed them is to take in the full body experience, which is when you're around something that's memorable or beautiful or um, aesthetically pleasing or simply something that builds contentment, to really not just take it in in the mind, but to feel the experience in the body. How does it feel to be, you know, at a place where we can relax and enjoy and feel contentment? What is that experience? Can we soak it in? Can we really get to know it in the body? That's the tools for really deeply embedding a contentment experience, which then begins to, uh, via neuroplasticity, actually reset our survival settings. Finally, the last tool, which is finding and establishing, and I harp on about this uh, every week too, but um, in life, the, if we don't have enough secure connections with people, people we feel that we can go to with um, difficult experience and talk about it, uh, that tends to make it very difficult for us to de-trigger our fear settings. Uh, basically, uh, a, a wonderful uh, psychologist named Robin Dunbar, he broke down our, the people we surround ourselves into three categories. The A people, which are the people we see every day. Uh, generally, they're in Western cultures, the people we have sex with, our boyfriends or girlfriends or third gender. How do I say that correctly? I don't know. I, what? Is there a way to say that correctly? Partners. Partners. Partners, okay. Take gender out of it. Take gender out of it. So, our partners. I'm going to get used to that. Our partners. <laughs> we tend to put all the weight on them. All the emotional regulation weight on them. So, What we really need instead are what's called B-type people, which are the people you might see once a week or once every two weeks, that you feel you can report your emotions, even the ugly emotions, the loneliness, the agitation, the resentment, the the sadness, the um, disappointments, the lack of direction, every emotional state. When you feel you can share anything with another human being, what happens is we lock in with our right hemisphere to their right hemisphere, and that then allows the orbital frontal region of the brain to override fear. The orbital frontal region of the right hemisphere is directly responding to how open and honest and disclosing we are to other people. You've noticed that in your life. Whenever you carry around a secret, you feel kind of miserable, I guarantee you. And whenever you unburden it and you find a sympathetic ear, you suddenly feel much less activated, much less um, cast out, much less vulnerable. This is because we only really feel that people have our backs when they emotionally know us. That's what the right hemisphere of the brain is set up to do. While the left hemisphere comes up with all the thoughts, your right hemisphere is looking for people that can emotionally receive your messages, your emotions, tolerate them, mirror them back, so that you've established safety. And when you do that, you will find yourself much less activated in life. Because even if somebody at work, like a boss, gives you a critical look or a lover doesn't a partner doesn't doesn't return your text or somebody looks strangely at you at the street, you know that you have people in your life that will take care of you. So once again the three tools are overriding the stress settings by using the breath, the body, finding out friendly faces in a room. We uh 
What was the second one? I already forget. Broad and build, positive emotions, contentment. And number three, have in our lives reliable friends that we can turn to by opening and expressing our core emotions. If you do these three tools, I guarantee you, you'll be able to find yourself a lot more calm and peaceful in the future. I thank you for listening. <laughs>